Over the following four weeks, I sit down with centre directors at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, based in Moscow, Beirut, Brussels, and in Asia. The aim of these discussions is to widen our understanding of how these crucial capitals view and appreciate the unfolding events of our times. The objective is simple, to understand the world through the eyes of domain experts in Russia, West Asia, Europe, and China. Today, to kick off the series, I'm delighted and privileged to welcome Dmitry Trenin. Dmitry is the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. He has been with the center since its inception and took the role of director in 2008. He served in the Soviet and Russian armed forces from 1972 to 1993, retiring from the Russian army in 1993. Trenin's postings included Iraq with the military assistance group, East Germany as a military liaison, Switzerland, for arms control, and Italy at the NATO Defense College. He also taught at the Military Institute in Moscow and VUB, Free University of Brussels. From 1993 to 97, he held a post as a senior research fellow at the Institute of Europe in Moscow. He was a senior research fellow at the NATO Defense College in Rome, and he has taught at the War Studies Department of the Military Institute from 1986 to 1993. Dmitry is a member of the Russian International Affairs Council, the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy, and the Royal Swedish Academy of Military Science. He's the author of a range of books, most recently perhaps his book, What is Russia Up to in the Middle East? Should We Fear Russia in 2016? Russia and the World in the 21st Century, again in 2016, Unconditional Peace in 2013, and many others. Dimitri, welcome to Carnegie India. Predictably, Thank you very much, my- David. Thank you. Predictably, my first question is on Afghanistan. General Nikolai Potrushev, the Secretary of the Security Council, was in Delhi recently. We saw pictures of him with the National Security Advisor and others. Presumably, he was here to discuss Afghanistan. How does Russia plan to deal with an Afghanistan under Taliban control? Well, Rudy, first of all, let me, uh, let me say how privileged I feel to be invited to you, uh, uh, by you to the, to the serious. Um, it's really a great opportunity to uh, reach out to a very important audience um, in uh, India and, uh, and Asia more broadly and, uh, and, and globally. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, of course, Afghanistan is uh, at the top of uh, uh, most people's minds when it comes to security and uh, and global uh, international relations. Uh, for Russia, the, um, the unexpected element was, I think for not just for Russia, for everyone, including um, strikingly the United States government, the speed with which the uh, previous Afghan government disintegrated. Uh, that took everyone by surprise. I think the Russians had been bracing for the uh, full, complete withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan, not something that uh, Russia was looking forward to. I think that uh, uh, seeing the back of American soldiers uh, leaving Afghanistan was, uh, uh, was something that uh, sent a message very clearly to the Russian security community that uh, now uh, Russia will have to do more to deal with the resultant mess. And now we have a new situation in Afghanistan. And Russia, again, from, from, from the Russian perspective, um, the Taliban were going to, uh, to take over Afghanistan. I think that uh, they've been mentally, uh, intellectually prepared for Taliban's victory maybe uh, after a, a, a longer interval after following the U.S. withdrawal, but uh, they, they knew that they would have to deal with the Taliban. For Russia, uh, the Taliban are not uh, the main issue. They are not viewed as a threat by themselves. They are seen as, as an indigenous Afghan Pashtun uh, movement, uh, caring about power sharing or power uh, seizure in Afghanistan, but not uh, willing to uh, transcend the borders of uh, Afghanistan and seek to destabilize Central Asia and other parts of the former Soviet space. 
Um, the problem is that uh, uh, post-American Afghanistan may be turned into a base for extremist operations uh, outside Afghanistan, again, Central Asia, parts of the Caucasus and elsewhere uh, within uh, Russia itself and the former Soviet space. Thanks, Dimitri. So if I can just uh, push you on that, which is clearly the Russian view of the Taliban is very different to the Indian view of the Taliban. And it's worth keeping in mind, of course, that for many in India, the view of the Taliban goes back to 1999, when a commercial airline was hijacked, taken to Kandahar, and it was Taliban militia that escorted released prisoners from India in exchange for the passengers to the boundary with Pakistan. So that's in very ways, in, in many ways, the image that stays with those in this country. Of course, India's also moved on. Um, Dimitri, this is a very different position for Russia compared to the 1990s. In the 90s, certain Russian agencies alongside Iran and India provided support to the erstwhile United Front or what's popularly known as the, the National Front. Um, in the recent days, we've seen the tragic fighting up in the Panjshir. Many rumors doing the rounds of uh, Pakistani assistance. It's unverified whether that's true or not. But it seems that the Panjshir resistance has all but faded. For what we understand, the leaders are now outside of Afghanistan, potentially somewhere in Central Asia. It puts Russia in a particularly different position two, two and a half decades down the line. Is there any thinking in Russia right now about legitimacy or legitimizing the Taliban or recognize this, recognizing this government? As you said, Russian leaders don't necessarily see the Taliban itself as a threat. Well, Russia has learned of quite a few lessons in Afghanistan. Um, I'm talking about Russia, including, of course, the Soviet period of Russian history. The Soviet period was, the Soviet Union was Russia uh, while it lasted. Um, you talked about uh, the seizure of an Indian um, uh, airliner. Uh, the Taliban also seized uh, a Russian plane. So Russia has exactly the same experience with the Taliban. Uh, Russia, when the, when, the Tali, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, um, most of Afghanistan, uh, a lot of Russians saw that as a, uh, as a harbinger of bad things for Central Asia and even for Russia itself. Uh, so there are no, um, no illusions about anyone in that part of the world. But uh, what the Russians have learned is that you deal with the realities that, that exist. Uh, you uh, do not choose partners. You choose policies with regard to the entities or with regard to the groups that operate. President Putin recently said that Russia is not interested in a, in a continuation of a civil war in Afghanistan. So better to have uh, someone to deal with in Afghanistan than to have nobody to deal with in Afghanistan. Um, so Russia, as you know, uh, did not withdraw its embassy from Kabul when the Taliban took over. Uh, Russia, uh, the Russian ambassador, very quickly established uh, contacts with the new authorities. And I understand that uh, uh, the Russian ambassador will be present at the inauguration of the, of the new Afghan government. Uh, does that mean recognition? Not in the legal sense of the word. I think that uh, again, uh, Russian officials have been um, have been on record saying that uh, there needs to be several conditions to be met before Russia uh, considers recognizing legally the new Afghan government as a legitimate one. These uh, conditions are very different from the conditions that the West is talking that the West is talking about. I don't think that there were any expectations. Uh, that the Taliban would include women in the, into their government, that they would allow women to, uh, to um, uh, handle themselves in Afghanistan the way they handled themselves in Paris or Berlin or London or wherever. Uh, people are more realist, real, realistically thinking than that, but they deal with the realities on the ground. Uh, having said that, there, there's a difference between recognizing the realities de facto and legitimizing a regime by de jure. 
And I think that there will be a gap or a distance or whatever, whatever you may call it between the two. And Russia will not uh, gratuitously uh, offer its uh, legal recognition to a regime. It needs to have some assurances, real assurances, not, uh, not verbal, but real assurances that the Taliban will not engage in activities that Russia would find dangerous or condone such activities by somebody else from Afghanistan. So when it comes to those assurances, it seems that there is a commonality of interest for countries like China, Russia, and India. The Indian prime minister will chair the the BRICS summit tomorrow in a couple of weeks down the line. Um, He will be represented at the SCO as will President Putin and uh, President Xi Jinping. Do you think that at this time there could be any ground for cooperation between the RIC, between Russia, India, and China when it comes to counterterrorism, notwithstanding all the troubles that India has with China on its boundary and in its own bilateral political relationship? Well, I think the question uh, should be posed to uh, the governments of India and China. Uh, I don't think that Russia has a problem uh, collaborating very closely with China and India bilaterally. And certainly Russia would want to have uh, the RIC as a, as, as a working mechanism, which I don't think it is at this moment, not at least not, not a very active one. Uh, but the, and, and Russia, as, as, as we all know, has been trying uh, uh, to facilitate contacts between high level Indian officials and uh, Chinese officials. Uh, in fact, it is, I wouldn't say embarrassing, because this is more than an embarrassment. It's a, it's a big problem for Russia, frankly, that its two uh, principal partners in Asia, the two Asian great powers, have such a strained um, and even to a degree adversarial relationship between the two of them. This uh, makes Russia's job extremely difficult to keep uh, the proper balance. Uh, in its uh, parallel relationships with Delhi and Beijing. And Russia, as, as, uh, as you will have noticed, I think, uh, Russia is uh, putting India and China into the, same, uh, into the same line when it talks about its uh, strategic partners, uh, not a paragraph uh, uh, on China preceding a paragraph in India, but it's in the same line because Russia doesn't want and cannot afford, frankly, in view of its own interest, to uh, choose uh, one over the other. I'm just, I was going to come back on India and China, but I may as well push you now, Dimitri. Um, many of us have read the national security document that was published recently. And as you say, China and India are literally on the same sentence within the same semicolon. Uh, but how does Russia plan to square the circle? I mean, isn't it going to be a hard task, given that India seems to be at a place at the moment where elites, decision makers are taking a step back and trying to consider what the longer strategic relationship with China will look like, the boundary, trade, technology, and political relations. Wouldn't it be better for Russia to try and treat both these strategic partners individually rather than trying to create or trying to think of them as a kind of a trilateral grouping, if they're thinking of them as a trilateral at all? Well, I think that, um, again, pragmatically, you should do both. You should have uh, parallel bilaterals with India and China, and then you need to have a a trilateral mechanism. Mm -hmm. Now, trilateral, as I said, depends on the the efficacy of of a trilateral engagement, depends on the willingness of uh, Delhi and Beijing to engage with each other. And we're dealing with three uh, major powers or great powers, however you want to call them. And the great powers uh, uh, decide for themselves. And uh, Russia cannot impose on India. Russia cannot impose on China. It can uh, facilitate, it can uh, offer good offices, uh, it can bring, uh, help bring, help cannot bring people together, but it can facilitate contacts between, uh, let's say, the Indian foreign minister or defense minister and the Chinese uh, counterpart when both happen to be in, 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 in Russia. 
Uh, that's what Russia can do, but it cannot do more than that. And if the trilateral doesn't work, then you have to, to uh, put the emphasis on the bilateral uh, relationships. But I think that uh, on, on, in, in the situation we're dealing with, it makes so much more sense to have a trilateral as much as possible. Uh, this does not mean that uh, the bilateral relationships will not uh, will be subsumed within the trilateral uh, format. I think that bilateral will be, for, for a number of reasons, uh, bi bilaterals will be more, more intimate engagements because uh, Russia and China on the one hand and Russia and India on the other hand have so much fewer problems within uh, the bilaterals than the, let's say, Indian Chinese bilateral. So that's that, that's how it that's how it is. I, I hope that uh, the trilateral will will uh, will uh, will be re-energized in the wake of uh, what happened in uh, Afghanistan. Because, as you said, and I fully agree with you, uh, the challenges, the threats that uh, Afghanistan potentially presents at this point, still potentially presents to India, China, and Russia, uh, are common concerns. I want to just move on to the role of the United States. You talked a little bit about great powers. Um, there's a lot of loose analysis, if you like, or analysis generally about American reputation, that its credibility has been somewhat stonewashed following the withdrawal in Afghanistan. There are many within Russia who've made a case that this is the right time to push on issues like Ukraine, for instance, where American credibility could be called into question. There are others who argue that Japan and South Korea and Taiwan should be worried about America's position. I don't necessarily see it that way. I don't, I think the question of credibility is divided, but I'm interested to get your view is how does Russia see American credibility as a great power today? Well, uh, I think that uh, you need to distinguish between uh, the rhetorical and the, and the real. In, uh, in rhetoric, uh, a lot of people you can, uh, here on television, or you can read um, their writings in, uh, in newspapers, uh, they're celebrating America's uh, defeat. They are talking about uh, America's loss of credibility. They're talking about crumbling American alliances. They are pointing fingers at Ukraine. They're basically saying you're next. Uh, Afghanistan has been abandoned. You will be abandoned too. Um, and all that. that. That's the rhetorical bit. Uh, serious people uh, do not engage in that. They have, uh, uh, first of all, they are dealing with the threats resulting from uh, this meltdown of the Afghan regime and the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban. Uh, but uh, Serious people also understand that uh, America's core alliances with uh, uh, Europe, Japan, Korea, and other countries uh, are not going to be uh, even dented by what happened in Afghanistan. Again, there, 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 there is rhetoric, there, is, uh, there are accusations, there are doubts expressed by people and, and all that, but that's that's not uh, that's not serious. The serious, the fundamentals of the relationship of, of the alliance relationships uh, remain intact, primarily because uh, all of America's allies have essentially, and that that happened decades ago, they delegated their foreign and security policy to the United States. They're not doing serious uh, foreign defense and security policy. Um, in, 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 in most cases, <clears throat> excuse me, since the end of the, uh, of the Second World War. In Britain's case, uh, maybe since Suez. So it's, uh, if, if it's the United States, then if it's not the United States, then there's nobody. Uh, no one is, uh, is, is uh, even France. France talks about these things but because that's, that's part of the French identity. But even France is not prepared to go it alone. And forget about Europe uh, getting uh, serious strategic autonomy. It may be autonomy within the, the US-led alliance, 
So American friends, uh, American friends and, and allies uh, are not trying to uh, build a counterweight to the United States. They, what they fear is that the United States may uh, lose uh, a portion of their interest in them. That's, that's the problem. But the United, for the United States, Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia, Canada remain very much part of uh, America's, um, America's block, if you like. It's um, uh, that this, and I'm using the word block because I think that the policies of the Biden administration in particular are directed at uh, cementing the unity within the West. This is one of the most important um, avenues of American foreign policy today. And the United States has passed from, uh, let's say, trying to help liberal democracy flourish or take root in uh, non-Western parts of the world. Uh, it's, this is the, the, the policy of the past. Now it's trying to defend the West, the core West, from the challenges of uh, authoritarianism, nationalism, and other non-Western, if you like, uh, trends that... Uh, um, that, that threatened to uh, undermine the liberal, uh, the liberal order. So um, I, I think that, and I would take issue with uh, Russia seeking to use Afghanistan to, uh, uh, let's say, take over Ukraine, if you like. I know there's a, there are a lot of <clears throat> lots of fears in the Ukraine and uh, other Eastern European countries about Russia, but. Um, Again, serious people uh, understand the difference between Afghanistan and Ukraine. And uh, they also understand uh, what it would take uh, to, uh, uh, let's say, bring Ukraine to heel. And uh, this, is, uh, this calculus uh, is not something that uh, encourages people to think about, uh, think along those lines. There, there's another problem. Ukraine that sees itself um, endangered, not so much by, by, by Russia right now, but by, uh, by the United States losing interest or Europe, the West losing interest in Ukraine. Uh, it may become jittery and it may become even less predictable or more unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Uh, than it is at this point, and uh, it could engage in actions to provoke the West to show more, uh, more um, support for it. That would uh, lead to a chain reaction, and would lead to some sort of a crisis. That is that that, that could be a, a problem uh, going down uh, uh, down the line. But uh, I don't think that anyone is is saying well. Americans have left Afghanistan, Let, let's push them a little bit so that they leave Ukraine to us and then we go back to reconquer the former Soviet lands. This is not, this is not on the cards. Dimitri, I just want to move to Russia and the United States in the so-called quote-unquote summit that took place earlier in the summer between the two presidents. You wrote a piece which was rightfully skeptical of the outcomes. How do you see this relationship how do you characterize this relationship in the near future? Do you see a breakthrough? Do you see a significant change? Or do you see a kind of status quo building in, given that the Biden administration has made very clear that for them, the key challenge is great power politics, it's Russia, it's China. Then, of course, there's this whole question of Russia's interference in American elections, which has a particular domestic appeal within the US Congress. Well, Rudy, I think that um, the the basic relationship between the United States and Russia, which is a uh, confrontation, is not going to change. And I think this uh, this may even go beyond the Biden presidency or beyond the, the remainder of his uh, four year term. It's something that will will take um, quite some time to resolve itself. Uh, having said that, uh, I think that there is a difference between managing confrontation and mismanaging. So I saw the meeting between Putin and uh, Biden as a, as a sign that uh, both sides are ready to engage to manage the confrontation. Again, no one is giving anything to the other side. 
And there can be no reset, there can be no detente between the United States and Russia in the foreseeable future. But uh, hopefully the two countries uh, can uh, proceed uh, carefully enough with each other to avoid uh, dangerous uh, situations that could lead um, inadvertently to uh, a military collision. Because we are essentially, uh, we reached the point where the next stage in the deterioration of the US-Russian relationship is an open armed collision. And uh, that is something that both sides uh, want to avoid. It may come uh, uh, as, as a result of uh, some conflicts uh, getting out of hand. Uh, you talked about Ukraine. It may happen as a result of some incidents, uh, again, uh, that could lead to, uh, to escalation. Uh, someone provokes uh, the other party a little bit too much, you know, sailing through somebody's uh, territorial waters, overflying something and getting, uh, getting shot at or getting shot or getting, su getting sunk, for example. And that could lead to, uh, to um, uh, very dangerous consequences. It could, uh, as President Biden said, it could result from uh, a cyber attack. So uh, the United States and Russia need to work a little bit uh, more carefully with each other so that these things are safely avoided. Uh, as for an improvement of relations, uh, I was not holding my breath as you, as you correctly pointed out, and uh, I'm not expecting it uh, anytime soon. Thanks, Abitian. Just a quick question. Uh note for our audiences. We've got questions from different platforms. I'm going to do my best to weave in those questions rather than keep a separate time for this particular special series. Dimitri, you talked about territorial waters and the question of managing confrontation with the United States. How seriously do Russian decision, make, decision makers take the quad? Well, I think they noticed uh, that uh, the quad has become uh, let's say more, more real uh, than, uh, than even recently, that the uh, deterioration of relations between Delhi and uh, Beijing is uh, making uh, the Indian uh, decision makers look more at the United States uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, some strategic uh, collaboration, uh, because clearly, uh, uh, you know, Russia will not uh, step in uh, into a potential conflict between India and China. That that's clear. Now, the United States sees China as a as a as a challenger, as its principal security threat at this point in terms of major power relations. India looks at China much the same way from its own perspective. So it's uh, it's, it's natural. Uh, and I think that uh, it's seen in Russia as, a, as an unwelcome development, but as a development uh, that was produced by, 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 by the changes in the geopolitical balance in Asia. There were hopes that India and China would manage uh, their major power relationship in a more peaceful way. This unfortunately did not happen. And... Um, and, and now we see the result. And the United States, from the Russian perspective, is using it, trying to bring India into its uh, circle of uh, close partners, if not formal allies. Um, the question on the Russian mind is, um, how will India manage uh, its... Um, independent uh, foreign policy and its close relationship with the United States. Will India be the first country, if you like, that would manage to stay independent, uh, being at the same time in a close strategic partnership with the United States? Because all the countries that are America's allies and partners essentially uh, recognize American leadership. I'm not saying that they take orders from the United States, but they recognize America's leadership. Will India be the exception? India is the only 
a country among America's formal partners and allies that is a, a great power. No one else is. There have been some has-beens, there are some European former great powers, but they are not, uh, they are not, uh, um, they do, wouldn't qualify as such in, in, in the present uh, situation. And the European Union, as we all know, is also not, not a great power. Uh, although it has all the potential of being one, but it's, it, it would not. Uh, and that is the question of the Russian mind. I think that most people in Russia would still say today that uh, the Indian strategic uh, culture does not um, allow India to subsume its national interest within some broader uh, strategic relationship. When India and the Soviet Union were close uh, strategic partners, India did not follow the Soviet Union. India had its own, it, it, it did not quarrel with the Soviet Union, that's for sure, but India did not follow the Soviet Union. Uh, again, I'm not drawing uh, parallels between the Soviet Union and the, and the United States as far as India is concerned, but it would be interesting to see how independent India's foreign policy will be and defense policy and security policy will be um, uh, even as India gets close with the United States. For example, uh, how, and this is a practical question for many Russians, will India uh, diversify away from its historical uh, military technical relationship with Moscow? Will it continue buying sophisticated Russian uh, weaponry uh, even uh, though the United States would object to that. The United States is objecting to its uh, allies, say Turkey, and its partners, say India, buying some Russian uh, hardware like uh, the S-400 systems. Uh, but, um, but it will be interesting to watch. I think that, again, as I said, the, uh, the, uh, the sympathy for India is great in Russia. The... Um, the legacy of, uh, of friendship is still there, uh, but uh, people will be watching. At this point, most people think that India would be able to hold its own, to be its own man, or if you like, its own person uh, in, the, in, in the relationship with the United States, but people will be watching. That and I think that sim of... similarly, yeah. similarly, I think some people in mm -hmm. India are asking a similar question about the Russian-Chinese relationship. Yeah, I'm going to come on. A, yeah, there's a parallel to that. Yeah, I'm going to come on to that. I mean, what you just said just takes me back to 1971. Um, you know, when India and Russia signed the, the famous Treaty of Friendship in August, there are many in the United States at the time and around the world who believe that India had thrown its lot in with Russia. But actually, what India learned as the war broke out with Pakistan in December of that year was that it was Russia that was trying to put pressure on in India to call for a ceasefire, but it wasn't convenient for India. It was the Polish resolution in the UN Security Council for a ceasefire that India had to contend with. So I think over the decades, India has kind of fortified this idea of autonomy. I doubt very much that you're going to see India kind of join an alliance structure or a treaty alliance structure with the United States. Um, I also find it interesting that it's one of the few countries where a foreign minister in the last six weeks has visited Iran twice, a Russian head of security, the director of the CIA is in Delhi this week. Um, it has stable relations with Israel, while at the same time, it has equitable relations with different parts of Europe. But of course, there are various tests. But coming on to the question of Russia and China, uh, Dimitri, this is, of course, a matter of much worry. So it's almost like a mirror image of the question about India and the United States. How do you see or how do you characterize the Sino-Russian relationship going forward? Well, it's a relationship between uh, two major powers that um, had... Um, very rich history behind them. Uh, the richness of history was uh, both in uh, the closeness of uh, their cooperation and in the um, vehemence uh, of their adversity. Uh, Soviet Union and China almost went to war, as, as we all know, and they had uh, uh, three decades of conflict, almost three decades of confrontation. Uh, Happily, uh, we uh, have a, a very good relationship with China these days, and this is, an, I think, the most important achievement of post-Soviet foreign policy. 
having China as a, as, as a close neighbor along a very long border and uh, an enemy is the worst thing any, anyone can imagine in this world even more today than it was, let's say 20, uh, not 20, but 30, 40 years ago. Um, I would characterize the relationship as uh, being uh, one where um, the two countries uh, will never turn against each other, but they will not necessarily follow each other. And that gives you reassurance and flexibility at the same time. China does its thing that Russia doesn't have to support. Russia has things that China does not support or does not formally recognize like the status of Crimea. But the two countries focus on their, uh, on their relationship. And that relationship has been characterized differently. Some people call, about, uh, call it an alliance. Uh, uh, I think the formal word is the formal uh, uh, description is strategic partnership. Um, in my view, uh, this is a, a relationship that allows two powers that would not want to be led by, well, China, uh, let me put it this way, uh, Russia will not walk under anyone. And that was why the Russian-American relationship unraveled uh, after the end of the Cold War. China walks alone. It does not enter into uh, alliances, certainly not with other major powers. So it's a close relationship, but not too close. China will not manage Russia, will not be able to manage Russia as a junior ally. And I think that the Chinese leaders understand that. Russia will not accept China as its senior ally. And that's where we are. In a way, it's a happy relationship because uh, there is no hierarchy in that relationship. And uh, it, is, uh, it, it is something that, um, that uh, benefits both countries at this point. And uh, it does not, it's, it's also a way to manage the differences. And there are quite a few differences between China and Russia. And these differences that a lot of Western observers thought for a long time would, would lead to unraveling of the relationship, like competition in Central Asia, like Russia's arms sales to India, like, or, or Vietnam for that matter, like China's uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, with infrastructure projects uh, across the former Soviet space. N none of that, none of those things has led to a, a market deterioration of the relationship. Everything is being uh, more or less managed. Uh, and I do not see looking, let's say, five years out, 10 years, maybe 10 years out, I do not see much change to that relationship. I do not see Russia... Um, following China. And I do not see China leading Russia. So many of, uh, of our um, of, of, of people in India who believe the idea that Russia is already a junior uh, partner or vassal of China uh, need to look at the realities a little bit more closely. I think that the whole notion of Russia being uh, a vassal of China is, uh, is built on um, maybe a misperception, but it's also something that I see, maybe I'm wrong, but I see it as a, as a, as a psychological ploy to use against Russians to hurt their self-esteem. So when people are telling you, you guys are vassals of that, of that power, you're, not, you're no longer independent, you're no longer great power, uh, you know, this is not something that uh, is pleasing to your ear, right? But this is, uh, in, in today's world, we have to, uh, well, we have to be ready to, uh, to deal with these, I would say, psychological uh, developments. Dimitri, we've got time for just one last question. And I've got a complicated question in mind. I hope I can articulate it correctly. And I want you to think about this particular scenario and then give your view on how you see India-Russia relations from a perspective in the Kremlin or Moscow. So on the one hand, what I think you will see over the next many years 
is India investing a lot more in the Indo-Pacific in the Quad. And in all, in all probability, the Quad will soon become a marketplace and kind of kind of move beyond the kind of security architecture at the moment. So there's then you're thinking of technological relationships, infrastructure building, economic um, investments in a blue economy. At the same time, and at least from an Indian perspective, what you see is a much closer working relationship between Russia and Pakistan. And given the unfolding crisis inside of Afghanistan, the view is that relationship will possibly get stronger. Russia is one of six embassies um, that still exists inside of Afghanistan, or at least for this particular point in time. The Russian, or rather the Soviet-Pakistan relationship was invested in sometime in the late 1960s, but it's crystallized in a particular kind of way now. So given this kind of scenario and the fact, you ask the question about will India continue to buy Russian kit for its defense, probably less and less so. And this is just my personal opinion. There will be a shift, I think, to the West and to the United States. There will be a balance that will be maintained. And I think it's very clear that India will make clear and if it wants to buy the S-400 from Russia, it will buy the S-400 for Russia. And I think at the same time, it will try and maintain that relationship with the United States on sanctions, et cetera. So given this kind of jigsaw, how do you see Russian leaders trying to diagnose the near future of, of what may be considered as an unempathetic India um, in over the next decade? Well, I think that difference uh, between the relationship that Moscow and Delhi had in the, in the years of the Cold War and the relationship now is that today we have non-exclusive relationships with each other. India is not focused on uh, its relationship with Russia as the relationship with a major power. Uh, similarly, Russia is not focused on, uh, on, on, uh, on Delhi only when it uh, deals with Asia. And uh, Pakistan is uh, certainly a big country and uh, it's important for Russia in terms of, um, uh, uh, in terms of the security situation in Afghanistan. I think that Pakistan is seen uh, not so much as an economic opportunity, it may be for China, but for Russia, this is uh, mostly about security and uh, the security uh, with regard to uh, Afghanistan. Um, I think we will have to live uh, with this more complex uh, situation. And uh, the important thing is that uh, even as uh, both countries diversify away from the formally exclusive relationship, they do not lose what constituted the, uh, the principle uh, bedrock of uh, Indo-Russian relations, which is mutual sympathy, mutual empathy, uh, understanding, um, willingness to talk things through with the other party. Um, the idea that India will not do anything that would damage, seriously damage Russian interests. Similarly, that Russia will not do anything that will damage India's interest. Is if we have that, then I think we will have uh, put the relationship on a solid basis. Again, we're not talking about reverting to, uh, to something that uh, has no, uh, no chance of being resurrected in the modern, modern world. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's important that we keep the the, the gist of the relationship, the core of the relationship intact between India and Russia. Uh, as for the Quad becoming bigger than uh, security, that's fine. I mean, Russia is, is, is not, Russia is not China. It's not, um, does not pretend to be, um, uh, you know, to, to uh, vibe with the United States for global economic leadership. Uh, that's fine for Russia. Uh, what's not fine for Russia is anything that impinges on Russian national security. That, that's the issue. Well, on the question of a gist and trust between Russia and India, perhaps this is one of the advantages of the larger Carnegie network, that there is yourself and your team in Moscow and in Russia, and there's a team in India. And I hope very much that both these teams can work much more closely together in making sure that we keep this line of empathy 
line of trust in many different ways, alive as we get on. But Dimitri Trenin, thank you so much for joining us for a special series on India and the world. And for our audience, please join us next week where we have Maha Yaya, the director of the Carnegie Center in Beirut, the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rudy. It was a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. <laughs>